It's time to show your true self. My name is Mistra the Mysterious Self. I've got a crew of tipsy unicorns and we're protected by our thoughtful crackons. If you know what it means to FBT, then you must be ready to get tipsy. Come on, babe, it's time to act. We welcome you with open arms, and that's a fact. Hello, everybody. It's Abby from Action for a Peaceful World and our Alaskan Oasis. And today marks the beginning of season two of the Tipsy Unicorn podcast. This season, we are focusing on listening to people's origin stories. We believe that people need to be given the opportunity to tell their stories in the way that is most meaningful to them and that it is our responsibility to learn how to be better listeners. Additionally, (laughs) we need to share our stories openly and honestly, including the emotions and how we were impacted. This open release of information allows us to be able to live as our authentic selves. For too long, we have tacitly approved the systematic and systemic oppression of ourselves and others. Based on my personal observations, I have come to the conclusion that things haven't changed because we all have been conditioned to believe we are powerless. Now, it has taken me nearly 10 years to finally understand that we all have the power to produce positive changes in our lives and that it requires the creation and the maintenance of brave spaces. These are places where we can fully tell our stories in the way that meets our needs. And as we begin to share our stories, we soon realize that we are not alone in this world in believing that things will never change. Yet, You will also understand that when we show up for ourselves, we are always right on time. We truly believe from the tops of our heads to the tips of our toes that together we will create a more peaceful world. This is the only way forward. This belief comes not only from studying the science of behavior and learning, It also comes from experiencing life as a cisgendered white woman who identifies as bisexual and neurodiverse and has endured a lifetime of adverse experiences, including intergenerational issues around mental illness, substance abuse, domestic violence, and psychological abuse involving racism, homophobia, ableism, classism, and sexism. Before we we begin, it is important to acknowledge that the work we are doing is being done in Tlingit Ani, the traditional homelands of the Tlingit, Haida, and Simshian people who have stewarded this land for millennia. We are forever grateful to the ancestors of this land, and our intention is to always act in the service of ensuring cultural perpetuity for the benefit and betterment of all future ancestors. We also acknowledge that the cause of most chronic systemic issues in this world are rooted in our shared history of colonialism, racism, homophobia, ableism, classism, and sexism. We are committed to always acting in the service of our shared commitment to dismantle systems of oppression, which serves as the foundation of our work. Now, on with the show. Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 1, Mistra's Origin Story. Today, you will hear the origin story of me, Mistra the Mysterious. Today is Sunday, August 1st, 
2021, and it marks the beginning of what my husband and I loving, lovingly call our birth anniversary month, because it is the time of year that we celebrate both our birthdays and our anniversary and the birthdays of our sheltered animals. The other day, I was given the opportunity to share space with some highly motivated advocates who are fired up about creating positive change in our systems. Given that we're at the last quarter moon of the thunder moon cycle that happened in July, it feels like just the right time to make a little noise. For my share today, I'd like to tell you the story of where I am today and the five years leading up to my arrival in this space. This story begins in April of 2016, when I began to realize that there were many things about myself and my family I have been actively avoiding. This realization wasn't pretty. There were lots of tears, a little yelling, and a strongly worded letter. A little over a month later, I attended a conference in Chicago, during which I heard many moving stories and had many pivotal personal experiences. It was soon after this that I began to realize I needed to make some significant changes in my life, but it was not clear what those were. This was the time that I began exploring possibilities about the next right action. In July of 2016, my husband and I visited my family on Prince of Wales Island here in Alaska, and our mission was to enjoy time with family and also to determine whether or not we were ready to make a huge shift in our lives. While I had spent the past 12 years serving neurodiverse people and their families, I had reached such a deep level of burnout that I needed to do something about it. What we decided was to sell everything that we owned and move to Arizona, or with everything that we owned in Arizona and move back to Prince of Wales Island, where I had gone to high school to help my dad and my stepmom run their oyster farm. This was a drastic move for us, yet we were hopeful that this was going to be a great opportunity for us to use our individual talents and take a much needed sabbatical from practice. We moved to Nockety Bay, Alaska in February of 2017. What we had hoped was going to be a rejuvenating experience during which we would reconnect with ourselves, each other, and our family quickly turned into a toxic cycle of coercion and harassment that was intolerable. We made the decision to leave the oyster farm in December of 2017, yet we remained in Nockety. The decision to remain in Nockety was not easy, but the reality was that we had sold everything and spent everything that we had had to move up here. Additionally, part of the reason we left the farm was that we were not being paid. We had come up here agreeing to below minimum wage and the business was not able to maintain that. Had we had had more accurate information and data before deciding to move up here, we definitely would have made the a different decision. That's 100% for sure. Um, but we were where we were, and this is where we decided to stay. At that point in time, we were super broke, and we were desperate. We were living on four acres of property. My dad had signed over to us in June of 2017. Initially, we were living in a fifth wheel trailer, but when we left the oyster farm, my dad and stepmom demanded the trailer be returned to them as it was their property. That was true, so we returned the trailer in July of 2018. It took some t time to complete the transaction as we had very little money and no alternative housing options. Um, but And during the time that we were still living in the trailer, we tried to work as much as we could and attempted to find alternative housing options. While this was happening, my dad was posting flyers around town, he was spreading rumors, sending derogatory emails to the community, and when our paths crossed, he would posture threatening, threateningly at us. Um, but despite all this, we continued to develop relationships in the community and 
build and live our lives. We found an eight by 10 wall tent, which was on sale on a local buy, sell and trade page. And the person selling it happened to have worked for the forest service training people. So he was able to quickly teach us how to set up and care for the tent. We took it, um, we took it home and for a few weeks we slept in a wall tent on the rocky ground on an air mattress that lost air every night and um, in a place where when it rained it would flood a little bit so inside would get a little wet. Um, we, we did that for a couple weeks but we quickly built ourselves a, a platform on which to put the wall tent to get us up off the ground. <clears throat> In this tent, we accommodated a queen size mattress, a desk, and a TV stand. It was very, very cozy, and um, then we kept it warm with a small electric heater. We also got an electric blanket, which was super helpful, and we had our dog Marley, who was, is very, was very snuggly and kept us extra warm at night. We lived in this tent until March of 2020, which was about two years. And um, for part of the time, we stayed at a rental cabin and lodges we were caretaking and at houses we were house sitting, but mostly we lived and worked in the tent. Um, during, this, during this time, my husband continued to work as a web designer and I worked as many odd jobs as I could find to fill my time and do my part to help pay our bills. What most people don't know though, is that on August 4th of 2018, we had a lawsuit filed against us by my dad and my stepmom, which claimed they had rights to the property on which we were living and demanded it back. This is also the day I attempted to talk to him, my dad, in person and was assaulted in response to that attempt to communicate. In mid-August, I began working as the migrant education recruiter for Southeast Island School District here. And it that was a very, this was a very interesting experience for me. Um, I was sent to Anchorage for training. And during this time, I was able to visit with my family and attend the training. And when I returned from the training, I be began the job of identifying families who qualified for the program. And what was interesting is that it seemed that this program was being was being used to get you know pull more money into the schools, um, into the school district, and address the needs of economically disadvantaged students. But it really wasn't clear to me at that time what exactly was being done to affect change and positively you know have a direct benefit on the kids and the families. Um, in December of 2019, a tragedy struck the special education teacher in Thorn Bay, which caused the family to have to leave the, the community suddenly. And this meant there was an immediate need for a teacher to take over her position. Given that I had previously um, been certified as a special education teacher in Washington State, I decided to apply and ended up getting the job. This required me to drive about an hour each way from home um, to serve students in Thorn Bay and also serve students in Kisan. The caseload seemed manageable given my skill set, and I was greatly looking forward to the opportunity to serve my community. And while the job seemed feasible given the drive, the caseload, and everything else I had going back on in my life behind the scenes, what I didn't know is that there were some things that were about to happen that were going to make things a lot more complicated for me. Um, so soon after beginning working as a special education teacher at Thorn Bay, my dad began posting extremely derogatory and defamatory flyers all over the island. And given the small nature and close-knit um, uh, close knitness of this community, he was really, it was an attempt to rally support um, from others in the service of forcing us off the island. What he didn't know or didn't take into account um, was that when I have a mission, um, there is no, next to nothing that can be done to throw me off my course. And after seeing the state of the schools, I knew I had to stay and see this mission through, no matter how bad he tried to hurt me. The other thing that happened to complicate things was that in January, three students transferred into Thorn Bay School who had extreme problem behavior, secondary to having young lives filled with traumatic life experiences, which mine paled in comparison to. 
still pale in comparison to. The school district and I was not fully prepared to address the needs of these children. Um, while the majority of my training and experience is in serving neurodiverse children with complex needs, the environment I was being asked to serve these children in did not meet those needs and therefore everyone in this situation was set up for failure, which created a very toxic um, working environment. There are quite a few memories from this time in my life that bring me great sadness um, as I felt very stuck and I didn't know what to do. Not only was I trying to serve the needs of these children and their families, I was trying to support the teaching team who was grossly underprepared while also attempting to navigate a working relationship with an aggressive administrator and then add the context of the underlayment of what was happening in my home environment and it was really a recipe for disaster. At the end of the school year, I decided not to return to that position I was, as it was taking too big of a toll on my mental health and I was unable to serve the children effectively. And during that six month period, I had witnessed and been the recipient of intentional and unintentional physical and psychological abuse from members of my family, school administrators, school team members, and students. And the reality was is that I didn't do anything to uh, fix the problems. Um, I tried to speak out, I tried to provide some resources, but I was at that point in my life so shut down and I really needed out. I was, you know, I was, had experienced a lot of traumatic um, life experiences and I was having difficulty managing and being able to do what I needed to do. Over the summer, I took some time, I worked some odd jobs as a housekeeper and a caretaker for a couple local lodges. I worked as a landscaper for some community members and as a weed farmer. Um, at this point in time, I was also serving as the secretary for the Naki Bay community and the Prince of Wales Chamber of Commerce boards. I really just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to find my path forward. In August of 2019, I began my second year as the mi migrant education recruiter. And while I was doing this job, I was also working on the details to launch our new venture, Action for a Peaceful World. The plan was to provide continuing education courses for behavioral scientists who were looking for a change in their lives and practice, and that would start with really making sure that they were okay as individuals so they could show up as their authentic, whole, and most effective selves. During this time, though, we were also working with a lawyer to deal with a property lawsuit, as well as frequently communicating with the prosecuting attorney in regard to the criminal case against my dad for assaulting me. All of this came to an apex between November 2019 and March 2020. This is also the period of time during which our dog Marley was hit by a truck on Thanksgiving Day, um, had her leg amputated, and then ended up dying on Christmas Day. Um, it was a lot on top of everything else. And, but luckily, um, thanks to some awesome friends here in the community, um, we were able to stay at a local lodge during its off season. Um, so we could take care of ourselves and recover and stay warm. Um, and we stayed there until March of 2020. The criminal case against my dad was concluded um, with a guilty charge that got him sentenced to 10 days in jail, which could be converted to community service, and the requirement to undergo comprehensive mental health evaluation. The civil case concluded with us agreeing to pay him and my stepmom $60,000 for the property he had originally signed over to us, which in the end we were more than okay with the settlement, if only just to be done with that era of our lives and try to move forward as best we could. In January, an opportunity came up in Nockety Bay for me to take over as the long-term substitute for the teacher who was being transferred to the Thorn Bay School after um, the special education teacher there went out on um, long-term medical leave. And so this gave me an opportunity to get back, you know, get um, back into the school. It had recently um, 
brought on new administrative team. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to really see what was going on in the general education programs and the special education programs underneath the new, new leadership. So from January 2020 to March or to May 2020, I served as a long-term substitute teacher in Nockety Bay, and I was supposed to function as both the general education teacher and special education teacher. The school environment was very toxic with um, lots of coercive behavioral management strategies being implemented, but really it, and I tried to address it and tried to, you know, make some changes, but really a lot of the attempts were met with um, resistance and blame shifting for the chronic issues. And, but someone was brought in um, early in that year to help us with training and coaching and support. Um, that was, you know, moving in the positive direction and, um, but it had just barely gotten started when COVID hit. And so then, you know, that threw everything, threw everything for a loop. Everyone, in my opinion, everyone did the best that they could in responding to the uncertainty that came with COVID. We all did the very best we could. And there were definitely some good things that came out of that experience, such as the realization that one-on-one -on -one services delivered via the internet can be very effective and sometimes more effective when working with students on behavioral or on, um, remedial academics. And we also took time to create professional learning opportunities for teaching team members to learn more about the brain, behavior, trauma, and how to best support um, children and families. During this time, an opportunity came up to serve as the district, to serve the district as the itinerant special education teacher the following year, who would serve as the, uh, serve students in Nockety Bay and Kaufman Cove. This position seemed like a perfect fit and a perfect opportunity for to you know for me to support the students and families and the teaching team and administration. It seemed as if all the stars were aligning and we were finally starting to make some positive changes under the new leadership. I was excited for the opportunity to be part of, a, of the solution. Over the summer of 2020, I continued to work on Action for a Peaceful World. Um, at the beginning of COVID and after the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, we'd shifted our focus slightly and were working to develop a program for behavioral scientists who were ready to take their work to the next level in the realm of applications to social justice movements. And this is also the time that the teaching teams and administrators were working on plans for the school year to mitigate the risks of COVID while also attempting to effectively educate children. This was a really difficult period of time for everyone um, because we were all trying to do our very best to plan for an uncertain future in an environment that was already really strained. So in August of 2020, I began my new job as the itinerant special education teacher assigned to serve students in Nockety Bay and Kaufman Cove. In September, following an abrupt departure of the special education teacher in Thorn Bay, I was told after an IEP meeting that I was being transferred to Thorn Bay the next day. <laughs> this was very difficult, a very difficult decision for me to accept because I was just getting settled in with my new students and families and there were already a myriad were already myriad challenges we were facing due to having to follow a strict uh, mitigation plan. Um, and the other aspect of this point of time that many don't really know about or really understand is that there was a lot of toxicity in the environment due to the need for continuous flexibility and the use of some coercive management strategies. It's, it's really, it's unclear to me whether or not any of this was intentional um, because we were all in a very stressful situation. But the impact was that there was this constant undercurrent of toxicity that put everybody on edge. There were decisions being made that were questionable due to them not, or due to them being too quick um, and not effectively including all voices. And this repeated pattern of behavior caused a lot of friction and tension and stress for all parties involved. I was given a draft schedule created by the administrative team um, that required me to drive to Thorn Bay on a daily basis in the morning, serve numerous students there, and then travel back to Nockety to serve students there. There was no inclusion of students from Kaufman Cove on the schedule, and there was little time allotted for report writing. 
Given that the majority of students had files that were drastically out of compliance, there were many evaluation reports and IEPs that needed to be completed. While administrators would say in writing that they valued teachers' time and fought to uphold their rights, the reality was that it was expected to come early, stay late, and work on weekends. This was a very overwhelming proposition, and I responded via email indicating as such, making a counter-proposal that I felt would better meet the needs of students, families, and myself. My response, unfortunately, was not well received and a meeting was scheduled for the next morning. It wasn't until I was almost to Thorn Bay that morning that the panic really finally started to set in. Not only was I already feeling unsafe and unsupported and unheard by the current administration, I was going back to the place where I had experienced very traumatic experiences. Um, in 2019 under the previous administration. By the time I reached the parking lot, I was sobbing uncontrollably and was gasping for breath. That day, I worked the best I could. I also had the meeting with two administrators and I began that meeting by self-disclosing that I had a panic attack earlier in the day I was feeling unsafe and unsupported due to changes being made without being consulted first and seemingly without prioritization of student needs. Um, I let them know I needed to record the meeting to I ensure I need uh, to ensure I had an accurate way to remember given the impact of stress on my memory and shared the history of trauma with the previous administrators that was likely exacerbating my anxiety. The meeting went fine, and I left feeling as though they understood my perspective and were willing to work with me. In mid-September of 2020, I held the Nockety Bay Community Echo Circle, which was my attempt to use the community organizing strategies I was learning to get feedback from the community as part of my work for Action for a Peaceful World. My intention was to utilize this feedback, which was directly from community members who were frustrated because they weren't being included in decision making, to the administrative team of the school district. While I had spoken briefly to the team about this prior to me doing it, there was definitely a backlash following the meeting. The outcomes from this meeting um, of the community, um, they shared were, those were shared. The outcomes were shared with a few people on the teaching and administrative teams, but the response was lackluster. They didn't seem to think that it was valuable information, which should be used to inform decisions. On the contrary, I was verbally berated by a fellow teacher and was chastised over the phone by an administrator who took my actions to be an overstep of my position and a threat to her, her uh, reputation with other administrators. In late September and early October, there were a series of events involving a student with significant support needs for whom I attempted to advocate for appropriate services. Due to the fact the student had a history of being underserved, administrators were concerned about the potential for a lawsuit and were making decisions that were rushed and didn't fully consider the context and best practices for serving needs with complex disabilities and significant needs. On the day we were to meet with the family, it was brought to my attention that the administrator was not going to be in attendance at the meeting. And get, so given the sensitive nature of this case, I spoke with the principal and suggested she ask um, the family to record it for everyone's protection. When I arrived at the meeting, the administrator whom I thought was going to be absent was actually there. And this was good news to me, as I felt it was extremely important for her to take the lead in this conversation. But I was met with verbal harassment about the suggestion to record the meeting. She said something along the lines of, you need to go put your phone and all other electronics in another room as you are not allowed to record any meetings unless the parent requests it be done. You cannot just record meetings because of your memory issues. Over the next few months, I put my head down and did what I could to simply meet the needs of the students and families as best I could. I reached out to multiple professional colleagues for advice and support. 
and their guidance was very helpful and guided me to begin advocating for myself and the team to be trained in direct instruction and precision teaching. It took a while to get this approved, but I was able to get funding for this, which began in January. While I was extremely grateful for the opportunity, it came at a cost because it was a rushed implementation. Rather than a thoughtful and a strategic one, it was uh, challenging for me to learn, organize, train, implement, and supervise all at the same time. Additionally, during this time, I was attempting to support students who were struggling due to the environment not being very conducive to learning for those who, with them, um, behavioral and academic challenges. It was an extremely difficult situation because although I could see the problems, I could not communicate effectively with the team in a way that would resolve these issues in a collaborative and sustainable manner. Following an incident in which a student left the Thorn Bay campus um, without permission, ended up being picked up by um, and taken home by law enforcement, and the parent not being contacted by the school administrators, I was contacted by the parent for support. The next day, I received an email from the administrative team that stated in no uncertain terms that my duties were changing immediately. I was instructed to only work with students and families at Nockety Bay and Kaufman Cove, not to contact anyone from Thorn Bay School and to leave everything to the administrative team. When I expressed concerns about discontinuation of intervention services, I was allowed to work on a very limited basis with a couple students in Thorn Bay and two in Kassan. And this allowed me to continue providing guidance to a few team members as well as provide direct instruction services to a few students who were in need of remedial academic services. Over the next few months, I continued to serve the students and the families as best I could given the circumstances. Near the end of March, teachers were beginning to receive contracts for the coming school year. When it seemed like all the contracts had been given out, I became very concerned because I had not received one. This was odd because despite all the challenges across the year, it felt as though we were actually on the right track and beginning to move in the right direction, although it was very slow. Um, after reaching out to administration to ask about the contract and plans for next year, it became very clear that there was little to no motivation to keep me on the team. I received a notice of non-retention and was given the opportunity to learn the rationale behind the decision and appeal it before the school board. The reasons stated were that enrollment was down, thus the budget wouldn't support a full-time special education teacher, and due to the fact I was SPED only, I didn't qualify for other jobs. Additionally, it was stated that there was no need for direct instruction and that the current special education administrator was capable of managing all responsibilities. Although I disagreed with the rationale, totally, um, and requested a hearing before the board, I made the decision not to appeal the non-retention, but rather to use the opportunity to have my voice heard by those on the school board who were charged with making informed decisions. This was at the very end of the school year, and once the school year was over, the first week of June, I hit the ground running on my campaign for effective, positive change on the island. So that brings us to today and where we are. It's August 1st, right? We've established the beginnings of a network of community members, local organizations, and professional supporters who are similarly motivated to affect positive change. We are on a mission to develop a network of people who are trained in direct instruction and precision teaching so they can provide effective supplemental educational supports to learners on the island of all ages. There's a lot of work to be done and we are very, very excited for the future. Over the coming year, we are hopeful that we can come together to create a plan that is 100% for us and by us. To do this, we are going to need to gather all of our resources and focus on our shared vision and mission. 
We will start this process by spending the next four months gathering all the necessary people, power, and material resources to make this successful. This will allow us to fully train a team to be direct instruction literacy coaches, as well as get more people involved in this movement. Our goal is to create a model that will serve as a framework for meaningful and sustainable systems change that will ensure cultural perpetuity for everyone. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening to my origin story. The past five years have been quite an adventure, as you can hear, and we are really very, very excited for the future. For far too long, the people of this land have been neglected. Whether this was intentional or unintentional is relatively irrelevant. The reality is that it's true, (laughs) and we can see this reflected in the current and historical data. At this point in history, we have an opportunity to do something to affect positive change. We know where the problems are. We know there are tools and resources that will adequately address these challenges. And now we must commit to acting in the service of our values. There are many ways you can get involved. So you can join us on Mondays at 5 p.m. for an action circle focused on organization. You could join us on Fridays at 9 a.m. for an action circle focused on implementation. You can share our work with your family, friends, and colleagues and use the hashtag OurAO. And you can support us with a financial contribution via our GoFundMe fundraiser. So given that the school year is starting, we are seeing an emergence of COVID-19 Delta variant, and there is a national movement afoot starting to focus on educational justice. We're looking forward to engaging you all in the organization and implementation of our plans. As Helen Keller is often quoted saying, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for all you do. I hope every moment of every day is filled with all the peace, love, and joy that your heart can handle. I love you all, and I look forward to hearing your stories. Goodbye.